Walk me through what you see for China growth and what's the read through to metals that you're seeing? Okay, when you look at the unconditional distribution of potential growth outcomes, they look pretty scary. But as soon as you condition it on policy, it starts to become steady as she goes, as you said, quite boring. Why? Well, you had trade wars out there, you know, impacting sentiment and investment. Uh, but as we saw last night, you had that local government special purpose bond. So the policymakers step in there, offset it, and you end up with something kind of, you know, which, straight across home plate. Which is kind of what we're looking at right here, right? Which is global right. PMI. It's not just China specifically, but global PMI, and then your copper demand growth tracker. Yeah, and I, well, I think what you get out of that is that the PMIs are sentiment. They are survey data. So when you have trade war and these other factors come out there, they impact sentiment, which then impacts investment, which is the demand for iron ore, the demand for copper. Um, but the key point here really is policymakers everywhere in the world are micromanaging this growth environment, whether if it's the Fed, you know, hawkish dovish, and right now when people are looking at a, at a dovish Fed, whether if it's OPEC raising production, you know, taking putting production back onto the market. Chinese policymakers, think about since January, massive stimulus, take it away. Stimulate, take away. And what they're doing is they're collapsing those tail risks. And so when we look at the unconditional distribution on growth, um, and we see it in the demand for oil, demand for copper, it's steady as she goes. It's a relatively boring demand outlook, so, yet sentiment swings. Jeff, take it forward a little bit. So let's assume for the moment that the U.S.-China trade dispute does not get resolved. Uh, anytime in the near future. Uh, China may well have to continue to stimulate as a practical matter. And let's talk specifically about infrastructure building. Right. Things that might drive things like iron ore and copper and things like that. Would that drive things up or is it a steady state with the trade threats with basically one offsetting the other? I think they stay offset. Um, you know, we were trading 6,500 on copper um, going back, what, six weeks ago. Trade war um, you know, broadens, markets, you know, we all went all the way down, I think 5,750 on copper. Um, and now we've traded back up as you start to take away those risks. Where's the economic fair value for copper? It's probably 6,500, 7,000. But I think the one thing when you go back to infrastructure spend, the developed markets aren't doing it. Um, the U.S. is not doing it. It's really, I was in Russia last week, you know, um, whether if it's national spending programs for infrastructure, you saw it last night in China, it says, hey, the outlook for EMs is probably relatively positive. They're the ones who are going to do this infrastructure spend. So you make a good distinction, and, and you can really, if you take a look at, say, time spreads versus the flat price, so if you take a look at, say, 1 to 12 months of, say, copper, for example, versus the overall flat price, you can kind of see what you're talking about, and that, in essence, the demand side, it's a tighter market, but it's not getting rewarded in the same way that you would think at a flat price. Is that like normal for all commodities? We're, we're seeing it in now? oil, we're like, seeing it across, the, across the, the commodity space, is that the fundamentals are tightening, which is being captured across the spreads. Brent is the one that's the most backwardated right now. Mm -hmm. um, however, this broader macro concern is putting downward pressure on prices. In fact, we put out a piece more rec recently is, you know, take profits in the macro space going back, you know, several months ago, uh, but focus on the, you know, the micro opportunities like the time spread in the different um, commodity markets because these, in fact, I, I want to emphasize, we've replaced macro risk with more idiosyncratic risk. You take the weak macro day in the, in the U.S., the yeah. payroll numbers, it was really driven by the floods in, in the Midwest. And by the way, climate change is impacting. If you look at weather, um, globally last month, it was one of the largest standard deviation moves we've ever seen. That starts to create a lot of uncertainty and idiosyncratic risk. So if you have the idiosyncratic risk, where's the opportunity? Um, I, I think at this point right now, we want to be trading you know, time spreads, relative value. Um, so if we think about our outlook for copper right now, long copper, short zinc, because you have excess supply in zinc. Um, we, if we want to trade gold right now, we want to be long gold against a short in silver. Um, and, and let's say we want to be long oil, long WTI against a short on, on Dubai. And I think that's the way you take out the macro risk and really focus on these fundamental micro stories.